There is really little doubt that the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans at which we arrive this evening and uh, where I'm sure you'll find it helpful to have your Bible open is one of what people often would call the great chapters of the Bible. Uh, Romans 8 is certainly one of the best known and one to which many people will frequently turn. Is it not true in your own life, for example, that you may have turned to the epistle to the Romans at, at chapter 8 in times of sorrow to be assured and comforted that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ when you have been in times of perplexity about circumstances and you have been assured from it that God works everything together for good to those who love him, when you have been aware of the weight of the guilt of your sin and you have wanted to hear afresh these famous and glorious words that we read this evening, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you are facing opposition of many different kinds, you may have sought out that part in Romans 8 where the apostle says, If God be for us, who can be against us? It is a chapter that so many people have found themselves turning to. But within the context of the whole of this letter, which we are seeking to understand because it is simply a course in basic Christianity. This eighth chapter of the Romans has sometimes been likened to a kind of plateau in the course of climbing some great mountain where people would customarily pause and look back on the way that they have come and perhaps allow themselves to see the heights that still have to be scaled and to ask now, where does this leave us after we have climbed thus far? Where are we? Where does this leave us? Where have we been brought to? What is the stage that we are at here? And when we come to the Apostle's argument in Romans chapter 8, it really is rather like that. What we find ourselves saying is, well now, where is it that we really have arrived at in Paul's unfolding of the gospel? Because that really is what the epistle to the Romans is. And the word therefore at the beginning of chapter 8 indicates to us that that's exactly what he is doing. He is encouraging us to pause for a moment and to look back and to recognize that there is a point that we have arrived at as we have grappled with some of these great and glorious truths about Christian salvation. And he says the place we have arrived at then is this. Therefore, there is now, now at this point at which we speak, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now there is a real sense in which from the very beginning of the epistle, this is the point that Paul has been aiming for and driving towards. It is the point that so many of his readers recognized that they needed to come to. And in some ways it is a long way from these earliest chapters of the epistle where we were hearing Paul recognizing that the whole of humanity was brought under the just judgment of God, that there was no such thing as a righteous man or woman, but all are sinning, all are unrighteous, all are under the judgment of God, and without exception we are guilty in God's sight. Now Paul has elaborated that. He has opened it up from various directions. How it is true of the Jew, the religious, orthodox Jew. How it is true of the Gentile, the pagan world, so like our own world in which we live in 1995. And Paul has been declaring 
that there is none, wherever he may look, there is none righteous, no, not one. And therefore the whole world lies guilty before God and under his righteous condemnation. And that's the plight of man and woman. That is the deepest problem that we have. The problem of humanity is not its unhappiness. The problem of humanity is its unrighteousness. And Paul is asking the question all the while, how can we deal with this problem? How can we deal with it? How can unrighteous sinners be brought into the presence of a holy God and declared righteous in his sight? And as he begins to unfold the truth to us, the truth of what the apostle himself calls justification, that is, how unrighteous men and women may be justified or acquitted at the bar of God's judgment. He now comes to the place where he says, where are we now then? What are we to say as we stand on this plateau? This is what we are to say. Here is where we are. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the glorious anchor for the people of God to have stability in their souls. And as he begins with that affirmation in the first verse of chapter 8, in the last verse, he gives to us the other stabilizer. Not only does he say there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, at the end of the chapter, he says there is no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing, neither things present nor to come, neither height nor depth nor any other thing in all creation shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Now the blessings of the Christian gospel are encompassed in these two glorious statements. There is no condemnation and there is no separation. Now let me point out to you that is true now, says the Apostle. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's not a promise for the future. He is not speaking about something that we will see when we die and go to meet with God in glory. He is speaking about a verdict that God now passes upon every believer, which is the verdict of the last day brought into the present day. And what he is saying is there is therefore now no longer any possibility of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now the questions that we need to ask of these first four verses which we are going to look at this evening and just these four, which are an introduction to the whole of the rest of the chapter. The questions that we need to ask are these. Where? Where is this extraordinary blessing that those who were being depressed by the truth of chapter 1 and 2 of the epistle and the beginning of chapter 3 could scarcely believe was possible? Where is this blessing of no condemnation to be found? That's the first question. The second question, what is this blessing that God has given in the gospel to believers? Third, how was it obtained for us? There seem to be so many obstacles 
There seem to be so many occasions when Paul is telling us that wherever he looks, there is no possibility of God being able to bring salvation to us by this route. How then is this blessing obtained? And the fourth question, why has God provided such a blessing? Where is it found? What is it? What does it consist in? How is it obtained? And why has God provided it for us? These are really the questions that are raised and answered in these four verses at the beginning of chapter 8. Let me turn with you to the first of them. Where is this blessing of which Paul speaks that is the glorious reality which he sees now that he pauses, as it were, on his climb upward to glory? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And these last three words provide the answer to the question that we ask. Where is this blessing of the Christian gospel to be found? It is to be found in Christ Jesus. Paul repeats the same words at the beginning of the second verse. Although in my version of the NIV, I discovered incidentally this morning that the NIV that I bought for a pound in South Africa many years ago is not the same NIV that many of you have. And I was amazed to hear Ivor Davidson reading what I thought was a much better translation this morning. But um, I've got the right one here tonight. Um, the NIV translates the beginning of verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, but it really is the same phrase, in Christ Jesus. And the answer to the question, where are all the blessings of the Christian gospel? No condemnation to no separation. Where are they to be found? The answer is in these words, they are to be found in Christ Jesus. Nowhere else in the entire universe Will you find the blessing of acquittal at the judgment seat of God except in Christ Jesus? And the reason for that, you see, is that everything that God has done to accomplish our salvation, He has done in Christ Jesus. Therefore, the vital thing for every condemned sinner whose lot and position Paul describes in the earlier chapter of Romans, the vital thing is that he should be found, that she should be found in Christ. Now, how do you come to be in Christ? Paul speaks of that a great deal, both in chapter 5 and chapter 6 of this letter. And the answer is that we come to be in Christ Jesus, united to Him by saving faith. We believe into the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we savingly believe in Him, we are spiritually united to Him. If you want a fuller answer to the question, it is, of course, that we are not only united to Christ by saving faith, we are united to Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit who baptizes us into Jesus Christ and thereby unites us to Him. Which, of course, is why every true believer is baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is the means by which we are made part of His body. If you want a still fuller answer to it, we are united to Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world because, Paul says in Ephesians 1, we are chosen in Him before the world begins. Now, this is the key to where every blessing of the Christian gospel is found. And I want to underline it to you. 
It is found not in a theory, not in a doctrine, not in an external thing that you and I may do. My dear friends, Christian salvation is in Jesus Christ. Nowhere else. And it is in his person and in his work that every blessing of the Christian gospel is to be found. So the only way I'm ever going to be able to say there is therefore now no condemnation to me is because I am united to the Lord Jesus Christ and have found in him that glorious reality of justification. Now that union with Christ is therefore the most vital thing. Paul therefore cries that I may be found in him. And he divides humanity therefore into those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ or separated from Christ, or without Christ. This is how he sees the world. And the answer to the question, where is this glorious blessing of Christian salvation found? It is found only in Jesus Christ. He is the life. He is the resurrection. He is the bread of God. Every blessing we have flows, therefore, from him. Now, the second question is, what are the blessings that we find then in Jesus Christ? And in verses 1 and 2, Paul points out to us what they are. The first of them is that in Jesus Christ we are free from the condemnation of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, as you may know, is the opposite of justification, which is one of Paul's great words throughout Romans, meaning simply an acceptance at the judgment seat of God, a declaration that I am righteous in God's sight with a righteousness not my own. Well, now he says this verdict of no condemnation is the first blessing of the Christian gospel. But notice there is another, and Paul links the two together. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, God not only sent his Son to free me from sin's bondage and guilt, he sent his Spirit to deliver me from the chains that bound me to sin and death. Notice what he says, through Christ Jesus or in Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Now you will remember if you were reading the latter part of Romans 7 with us, that the apostle is deeply conscious, as every Christian believer is conscious, of a battle that goes on in our lives as Christians day by day. It is the battle of my sinful nature against the law of God. And Paul speaks about how the law of God which I desire with my inmost being is battling against the sinful nature which wants to disobey it. And he finds a, a battle, a warfare going on in what the authorized version calls his members. And this battle leads him to the frustrated cry at the end 
of verse of chapter 7 verse 24 for example where he says what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death and then he gives us the answer concisely thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord it is in Jesus Christ that the answer to this appalling, wretched state that he finds himself in is to be discovered. And what Jesus Christ does is this, notice. In Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. What that law of sin and death is doing in Paul's life is to drag him down into sin. And he finds it constantly there. You and I find it constantly there in our own lives. Paul says he has a desire to do good, but he does not do it. The good he wants to do, he does not do. Because the law of sin and death drag him down and he cries out who will deliver me now there is a glorious truth that the apostle expresses to us in these first four chapters of Romans he tells us that God has done something in Jesus Christ not only to take away our condemnation but to deliver us from our bondage to sin. And the gospel of Jesus Christ and the blessings of salvation are not simply that our guilt is taken away. It is that the bondage into sin, into which sin has brought us, is taken away. You will realize how important that is. The hymns are full of it, of course. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free, says the apostle. In the hymn that we're going to sing shortly, Charles Wesley helps us to sing, No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him are mine. But he then goes on to say, My chains fell off, My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. It would be a very poor kind of deliverance for somebody who had been guilty of a crime and who somehow or other had his guilt taken away if someone came to the prison cell where he sat and put a notice over it saying, this man's guilt has been atoned for and left him locked up. Clearly what he longs for is to be delivered from the bondage in which he sits. Now Paul says, the law of the spirit of life set me free from this downward drag of the law of sin and death. What does he mean? Well, what he means is that the Holy Spirit, you'll notice the NIV has a capital S at the law of the Spirit of life. The Holy Spirit, the life-giving Spirit of God, comes into the life and being of the Christian believer And there is a new principle, there is a new law that is at work in him. It is the law of life. Whereas the law of sin and death has done nothing but to drag him down. Now it would be a false picture for us to imagine that the Christian believer simply lives all the time in this defeat where the dominant power in his life is the downward drag of the law of sin and death. And the law of the spirit of life 
overcomes the downward drag of the law of sin and death and enables him to live victoriously. That's why old Ralph Erskine, one of the great figures of our Scottish religious history, once wrote a little couplet having spoken of how the law was unable to save the sinner, he says, but better news the gospel brings, it bids us fly and gives us wings. Now that, of course, is what Paul is speaking about. Can you think of how this happens. I have illustrated it to people in this way. What happens when if I were here in this pulpit and took a dead hard stone in my hand and threw it from here into the middle of the church, it would of course be affected by a law immediately it left my hand. And the law would be the law of gravity which has a downward drag and would bring it down, hopefully avoiding some of you in the front rows. But if I said now I'm going to do something similar and I held in my hand not a dead hard stone but a live bird, and I threw that into the air, would the law of gravity be suspended while whatever happened did happen? Of course not. But there is another law which takes over and defies the law of gravity and is stronger than it, and the bird flies. Now, the law of sin and death is not abolished in this world. The downward drag of our sinful nature is still there. But my dear friends, when Paul says, Who shall deliver me? And says, Thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. He is speaking about how God is concerned not only to remove the guilt of our sin, but to deal with its power. And the power of sin is dealt with by the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. And Paul says, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Now I want to say to you again, as I was saying last time when we were studying chapter 7, this does not mean that the Christian will move out of the realm where he is aware of being a wretched man, often a failure, but the difference is this, the sinful nature dwells in him not as the honored guest and master of the house, but as a squatter, unwelcome there. The honored guest and the master of the house who is in charge is now the Holy Spirit. And you will know that people who have squatters squatting in their property do want to get rid of them, but often find they can't. And you will discover that because you have a persisting sinful nature through all of your life in this world, you will be unable to rid yourself of it. In other words, there is no such thing as perfection in this world. That's why when people used to come to Charles Spurgeon and say to him they wanted to join uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle and said, we hope that this is the perfect church. And Spurgeon used to say to them, well, it might be, but when you join it, that will be the end of that. <laughs> For the simple reason he recognized 
There was no perfection possible in this world. But my dear friends, that does not mean that there is no such thing as victory over sin in the life of the believer. There most assuredly is. And let me say to you, when the Apostle says to us, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then says, because through the Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. He is speaking about the possibility for the believer of living a life that is pleasing to God, not because of anything in ourselves of ourselves, but solely because of the Holy Spirit in us. What are these blessings? They are the two classic freedoms that the gospel brings, freedom from sin's guilt and freedom from sin's bondage. How has God achieved this double freedom? Let me draw your attention to it in verse 3. For he says, what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Now there is the truth in a nutshell, in small compass. What is he saying has happened? Well, he said the law could not do it. That's been Paul's recurrent theme throughout this epistle. The law is helpless to save. If you have ever been in the position that I was in as a young man, brought up in the parish church in Springburn, and being told again and again, the way to gain eternal life is to do your best, live up to your lights, and God will never keep you out of the many mansions. That was the doctrine of the times, as it is for many of us. And I tried... I try to live according to the Sermon on the Mount and the Ten Commandments, which was the counsel people had given me. And it was a counsel of total despair. I found I couldn't do it. And because this was so utterly unrealistic, I was on my way to abandon everything I knew about the Christian religion, which wasn't very much I discovered afterwards, but I was going to abandon it all. Certainly I was going to abandon church. But what the Apostle tells us is what the law could not do. Not because there's anything wrong with the law, but because there's something wrong with me and with you. The sinful nature does not find it possible to obey the law of God. And when you get people giving you counsel, oh, you just keep the Ten Commandments and live by the Sermon on the Mount, you come back from your failure broken by the law of God and by the Sermon on the Mount whose standard is far beyond you. And you say, what I need is not a lecture, but a Savior. And Paul says, God has done it. You know how you sometimes get these cries when someone has succeeded in something? God has done it, he says. Now this is what Paul is saying. What the law could not do, it was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man or flesh, to be a sin offering. Well, he is telling us in small compass that only God could do this. That's the first thing. That what God did was this. He sent his Son. The way he sent him was to send him in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took our flesh upon him and became one of us sin apart. And then he became a sin offering. That is, he offered himself without spot to God. 
and all the judgment that my unrighteousness demanded, that all my unrighteousness called for, was poured out not upon me, but upon him. He was my substitute as well as my Savior. He was the one who was offered in my place for my sin. It's the kind of substitution that I suppose Barabbas, whose story we tend to read a lot as we come towards Easter, Barabbas would have understood better than anybody as he knew what it was to have been told by the jailer, there is no condemnation upon you, you are set free he knew both deliverance from his condemnation and deliverance from his bondage. He went out, and as they took him out into the sunlight and he saw these three crosses, Barabbas knew, of course, that his two compatriots were to be one on either side of him, and that central cross was for him. And on it instead... There hung the one who was the sin offering Jesus Christ himself. And Barabbas would have understood it if you had come close to him and begun to sing, In my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's what God has done in Jesus Christ. How did he contrive this amazing blessing of being able to say to us as the truest thing the Christian believer can ever hear, there is no more any possibility of condemnation for you. It was because he sent his Son who took our nature and bore our sin. And the last question is, why did he do it? Why has God done all this? Well, he doesn't leave us in any possible doubt in verse 4. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. I say to you again, the difference in the Christian believer is not that he no longer has any sinful nature. He does have a remainder of sin which will plague him to the end of his days. But the master of the house, the crowned guest, is the Holy Spirit who indwelling us is the Spirit who delights to write in our hearts God's law. That's his great work and function prophesied in the Old Testament. I will write my law. This is the new covenant. I will write my law in their hearts. Why has God done this? He has done it so that the righteousness of the law which we could not attain may be written in our character and that the moral beauty of God in Jesus Christ might shine out from us. That's why he has done it. And later in the epistle to the Romans, he will be unfolding this for us in all its details from chapter 12 onwards. This is how the lineaments of the will of God for our lives are written in to our character. What a glorious plateau the apostle has brought us to. And how glorious to be able to hear the words that he speaks as the truest thing that has ever been said to us. You are set free from the condemnation of sin 
by the Son of God whom he sent to be the sin-bearer. And you are delivered from the bondage of sin by the Spirit of God whom he has sent into your heart. What a gospel. What a God. What a Savior. Let's pray together. We bless and worship you, our gracious God and Father, for all that you have wrought for our salvation. And we bow down before you and ask that you would enable us that in our life and character, day by day, the beauty of your purposes for us may be displayed for the glory of your name. Amen.